we're going to talk today about active and collaborative learning and we're going to try to use some of the techniques and you probably are really good at this already because what do you do? You take your students, you go into a lab and you give them application, right? So as far as that aspect of it, you're doing it. It's how to maximize the effects and or, or the learning with the process of active and collaborative learning and really you should say active teaching, collaborative learning because it is the responsibility of the instructor to be pretty active, right? My students think I'm really energetic. Um, they say high strung, right? And if I have coffee, at, you know, before class, <laughs> not good. Anyway, um, and all of this will build upon what Dr. Mayo talked about this morning in strategies and teaching styles and all that stuff. Uh, before we get started, though, I want you guys to take a minute, uh, maybe two minutes, talk to the person next to you about what your ideas of collaborative learning would be or what's a great practice that you're currently doing that you would like to share with the group. So again, this builds upon what Dr. Mayo was talking about earlier and this is part of the, the process is you find out what those misconceptions are or you find out what the, take an inventory of what's already known about the subject. So you guys go ahead and do that. Right. As a teacher, as teachers, you guys know that if you ever have another student teach someone else, they understand the subject so much more. Matter of fact, when I started teaching, I learned what I didn't know, right? Because students will ask you, and, and if you don't know the answer, uh, you're like a deer in headlights. So, um, great example, though. Anybody else want to share a great practice that they're using collaborative learning for, where they've got groups together that are exchanging ideas, please? this to the food and beverage director and illustrate this on a big piece of paper and so they do that and then after that time is up then they present each group presents and I tell them each person has to talk otherwise the one person in the group right. likes to talk and then they all participate one of the strategies on collabor collaborative learning is is you have let's say you have four to five students and, and you each group is three. three okay so three students and you assign roles right so this is your responsibility within the group uh, and then they come to give that presentation, whether it be oil or whatnot. And the day of, you say, okay, so you three did this project. I want you to present her, spot, her portion, and I want you to present her portion. And you mix it up, and they're like, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. You didn't. Maybe you spelled that out in the syllabus. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the idea is that they know the report so thoroughly that they didn't just do their component, and then they're, they're done, right? So they learned the whole thing. Uh, but active and, and coll collaborative learning enhances soft skills through communication and teamwork while enhancing learning through meaningful engagement. Uh, the idea is that you constantly are engaging students because you know there are students that will sit there just because mom said they had to go to college, right? Uh, and you're going to feed them. There's that too. So what is active collaborative learning? A strategy that strives for everyone's success through meaningful collaboration of ideas and work while enhancing social skills through roles. And uh, you guys work for a college, you probably do some sort of uh, faculty development or, or training annually, right, where you get together. I remember when I was teaching at a, uh, the, the, the school where Sweet Roseanne is from, um, we did the Covey training, right, which is really involved with let's talk about these strategies and how to implement them in our daily lives. Let's give them practical effect. And uh, it was way more meaningful 
the takeaway from that event was more meaningful than someone sitting up there and lecturing, saying, do this, do this, do this, and do this. It doesn't work that way. Um, but this will enhance social skills, help students understand roles, and I look, I'm going to focus on those top three, promotes team success. Now, how many of you work for a community college? All right, so you have advisory boards. What is one of their top five things that they want their student, that they want your graduates to be able to do? Show up on time. Work with others. Work with others. So, <laughs> have the skills that they require. So, the technical skills need to be there. Communication, Communication critical thinking, Problem right? Solving. All of these are soft skills. Guess what this teaches? It teaches them how to function in a community, how to get along, how to understand roles, right? So, if you use it as a strategy from day one, and um, you, you, you have to teach them how to use the strategy. But if you use it as a strategy from day one, when they graduate, not only will they have the technical skills, because you're excellent teachers, I heard so earlier, <laughs> um, then they're going to have those, that understanding of workforce readiness. So all of this enhances the readiness for workforce, fosters community. Now, let me talk about that real quick. Retention. How many of you have to get on the telephone to call students and say, hey, you know you missed class last week? Right? That's annoying. I do it too. I can't stand it. If they have a learning community, one which they're beholden to, <laughs> maybe, you know, you call your partner and say, hey, I noticed you weren't in class last week. We had a project due and you weren't there. So it helps students within the community get uh, to these people by phone. So it, not all the work's on you. And it also promotes diversity, diversity in ideas. And so what we're going to talk about uh, when we go over uh, the base groups is you want to make sure that your groups are heterogeneous. Um, so that not everybody's exactly the same. Instructional strategies that, strategies that we see today, guys, I know that I talk fast. If I need to slow down, let me know. Uh, instructional strat uh, strategies, direct instruction, you've got an active teacher, which is the sage on stage. You've heard that before. Passive student, which means they're sitting there and maybe they get it, maybe they don't. Uh, requires active listening on the part of the learner. And if they've never, if they've never understood how to active listen, right, and you guys know what I'm talking about. It's not just hearing what, what is going on, but really listening and understanding what's going on. Um, then it can not be so beneficial. Learning activities, you have note-taking, observation, homework. This is the traditional school that we all grew up in. Uh, it is boring. It's very boring. Uh, independent study, which I've done a couple of since I've been at Faulkner State, is where the student takes initiative to, to be the learner on, its, on their own. And I've got to say, it's, it's not the best strategy. And you can only use that with, um, you know, students that are really sharp. But the teacher is the facilitator. The student becomes the catalyst for learning activities or web experience research projects. All right, so these are less effective than the next two, which are interact interactive instruction, which is an active student teacher. Both are active in this case. You don't have just the passive listener. Um, live discussion and sharing. So we're sitting here talking about what, what your uh, employers are looking for in graduates, everybody's involved. Uh, learn from peers and teacher, develop social skills and articulation, <clears throat> learning activities, debates, group brainstorming, and structured controversy. Uh, the gentleman in the rear, he was talking about earlier, he teaches law and liability. law and liability, law and law case law. studies, or um, even little, little moot court projects, you know? Uh, experiential learning. Now, this is you know, what you might think of as OJT, on-the-job training, get thrown into the, you know, the, uh, the predicament and then see if you can get out. Uh, but teacher is the guide. Student is independent learner, and it has inductive learning and critical thinking. Emphasis, emphasis is on the process rather than, rather than the product of learning, right? So it's all about the experience and what you're going to take away from that experience. Uh, one of the things that we do at Faulkner State is uh, annually we take our students to Auburn, University where they have a meat science program and they take the whole carcass from from hoof to case So they know where all these pieces come from now. Are they ever gonna be a butcher? Probably not But they do get to see that exp they experience how that beef gets on their plate um, And the takeaway for them is you know, you know, I really never understood this process Now I get it and I'll respect the meat so much more um, learning activities, lab work, simulations, experiments. Uh, nursing programs are really good about these simulations, or all the health occupations are good about simulations because they've got these mannequins. Has anybody seen those? 
they bleed, they, you can kill them. Right? <laughs> you can kill them. But it's better than killing a person, I guess. All right, so the cone of experience talks about, I don't know why this is yellow, but it is. It, it's not designed that way. Uh, the cone of experience, people understand 10% of what they read, 20% of what they hear, 30% of what they see. And notice you've got with still pictures, watching moving pictures, view exhibits, and watch demonstration. This is where I think most teachers are going to spend most of their time, right? They're going to do the demonstration. I'm going to show you how to make hollandaise. But like Dr. Mayo said this morning, you show them how to make the hollandaise. Are they going to wash their hands or saute, wasn't it? Are they going to wash their hands first? You have to explain to them the, the important points of the project. Um, but if they screw something up, now we're getting down here. Participate in hands-on workshop, role play a situation, model or simulate a real experience, and then direct purposeful experience. Go through it. I'm going to tell you, when I was a young man, I went, um, I went overdrawn in my bank account. Anybody ever done that? My mom didn't teach me how to balance a checkbook. I wish she had. But I had to go through this direct purposeful experience. <laughs> now, I'll, I'll make it even more um, meaningful is I worked at a bank in the executive dining room and that's where I had my checking account and it was the president that said don't do this again <laughs> ever <laughs> you'll be unemployed anyway um, I did learn 90 percent of what I went through on that right so if you can get your students to go through it then the, and they have this aha moment of self-discovery it's more meaningful to them because that's what life threw them we are a product of what happens to us through our life. All right, so a goal of collaborative learning is to break up instruction and to increase student engagement, right? Now, I'll tell you, the, the mind can only take what the backside can endure, right? You've sat through four-hour courses, haven't you? And you're like, will this ever end, right? So what can you do? Find little activities that break up the instruction. And they don't necessarily have to be even relevant, right? They can be stand up, walk around the table, and sit down. Just break up the monotony of sitting and listening and sitting and listening, because uh, that gets very boring. The average time a student can concentrate during a lecture is only 15 to 20 minutes, 25 minutes, right? So we're going to do a, another activity here in a second, which is going to break up what we're doing now. Uh, the brain remembers best what comes first and what comes last. So as Dr. Mayo was talking earlier, what did he have you do? Let's have an opening activity and let's have a closing activity. R write down what you learned today, right? Uh, and here's an example of designing a course that's only two hours. First 10 minutes of class, set expectations, introduce the topic and take inventory of student knowledge, right? Which is kind of what we did here. All right, let's find out what you know about the subject. This is called, in the, in the strategies, this is called the big question. Right? It's kind of getting the student ready for what's to come. Instruct for 40 minutes, followed by an activity for five minutes. And I know 40 minutes is long, but this is a two-hour class. Uh, instruct for 35 minutes and assess learning orally for 10 minutes. So constant review and assessment. All right? See how effective you're being in your lectures. Right? So as we, as we cover holidays, okay, tell me, tell me what was wrong with blah, 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 or show them a video <clears throat> and tell them what was the mistake. Uh, and then struck for 20 minutes, followed by a learning assessment. And this is one of my favorite things to do is exit ticket, which is what you did earlier. Keep notebooks in, or uh, note cards in your classroom, pass them out, and every single student write on there something that you learned today that you can use in your workplace or that you can start using at home, something that's practical. Make it real for them, not abstract. Because, um, I mean, there's lots of things that, People try to teach me, and I'm like, it's abstract, I don't really understand. Uh, math, people have a, a problem with math, because it's abstract. They don't understand that, you know, two quarts plus two quarts is a gallon, right? But if you can actually make it practical for them, they start to get it a little bit better. <clears throat> so that exit ticket works out great. All right, so the first 10 minutes is going to be the big question. Uh, and what we did was think, pair, share. And I think uh, Dr. Mayo called it something else different. Uh, th uh, does anybody remember what he called it? Declare, declare, declare pair, share. Is that what it was? It's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so you had to think about what the topic was, pair with a partner, 
and let's talk about what you, th what you think is with her, and she's what's going to tell what, what she thinks it is with you, uh, and kind of find out what you know about it. Uh, but that will take an inventory of what is already known. It also might un uncover some misconceptions. And let's face it, culinary educators, Food Network makes our life hard. I'm grateful for it because it makes our, 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 our industry popular, but it, is, it does make our life hard in some instances. Thank you, Rachel Ray, E-V-O-O, -O, every time. <laughs> right? Um, ask students to use their smart... Does anybody know why Guy Fieri is yelling? Like he's always yelling at the TV. Does anybody know? <laughs> Y'all don't know. Okay, so I just wondered if I was the only one that's wondering why he's yelling at me. <laughs> Ask students to use their smartphones as a method of research to quickly get highlights of the topic. And I know this is a touchy subject for some of you. How many of you know that even if you ask your students to leave their phone in their car, they're never going to do it? <laughs> they're never going to do it. So as a, uh, in my syllabus, I spell it out. I realize you're not going to do it. So let's try to maximize the use of you bringing your cell phone to class in the first place. And I'll show you another couple of uh, things in a bit that'll um, make that even cooler. Am I going too fast? I talk too fast. Uh, so you're also going to pique the student's interest with classroom discussion that has practical effect. Again, bringing that to everyday life and making them understand why it's important to understand what you're trying to get across to them. All right, so the different types of, of learning communities within the cooperative learning um, strategies are the cooperative base groups. And uh, in your law class, this will be perfect. Or Surf Safe, who teaches Surf Safe, right? Come on, that test is a little bit tricky, isn't it? The Surf Safe exam is a little bit tricky. So in your cooperative base groups, this is a perfect time to use them for pre-test studying, right? And you have to give them time for it. You can't just expect them to meet on their own because they won't do it. Right? But base groups are long-term and stable for the semester or for the year or for even their whole time through the college. They are made up of students with different aptitudes and perspectives. So this is the case you want to uh, make sure that they're diverse. Right? You don't want... I know that sometimes you think it's the easy way because you... Or it's the easy way and you say, all right, you just pick your partner today. Right? Because you don't want to hear this whining and groaning. Yeah. But if you make sure they're... they're uh, diverse in nature, then your results will be a little bit better. Uh, they hold each other accountable for group responsibilities and aid and retention, which we talked about earlier. They make academic progress socially in a healthy and meaningful way. Now, you all know that when you do group work, that doesn't always happen, does it? Right? Sometimes you have the guy that won't shut up, or the girl that won't shut up, or the one that thinks they have to rule everything, or the person that's going to be doing nothing. We're going to talk about how to address those issues, too. Uh, best to schedule time during the semester when groups can meet. So uh, there's a couple ways of going about that. You can schedule class time, or you can schedule <coughs> um, extracurricular class time in your syllabus. Spell it out, saying, you know, this course will meet Monday through Monday, t Wednesday, Friday for the semester, but you're also expected to meet this day on, at this time. And, if there's an additional time that you want to meet for that. You can, um, I don't know about your state's regulations, but I'm allowed to do it. I would hope that you might be allowed to do it. Uh, also, who uses an online learning platform? Moodle or, or uh, Blackboard, right? Uh, we use Blackboard, and we have a Blackboard Collaborate, right, which you can set up groups for discussions. And so you can make sure your base groups are communicating, communicating online, and you have proof of it. Right? So you can see what their activity is, is um, while they're not even in the classroom. So uh, scheduling time doesn't necessarily, ne doesn't necessarily have to eat into your instructional time. Uh, you can do it other ways. <clears throat> All right, so for the cooperative base group, uh, remember these are going to be for the whole term uh, homework check. Right? Once you get to class, have your, your base groups that you've set up at the be beginning of the semester. Right? Let's say it's these three people. As soon as they get in, the first thing that they do is they do homework check. Make sure everybody did their homework. I didn't say what I did in college. Hey, you got your homework? Let me see it. <laughs> Not that. <laughs> so you do have to, that's part of the act of teaching. You have, to, you have to walk around and make sure that people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, term research papers, 
And I know that this one is picky too because students say, I don't wanna, be a, I don't wanna have a research paper with so-and-so because I'm gonna wind up doing all the work and they're gonna be loafing, I just, I don't wanna do that. Uh, and grading issues. Um, you know, does that person deserve the same grade that I do? Probably not. But again, we're gonna go into how to fix those problems. Role playing simulation. Note check, if you've got students that uh, don't take notes or they're bad at notes or have never learned how to take notes, then you could have your base group say, hey, how are you doing with your note check, right? But make that an activity that they're actually doing and that way the person that's not so good at taking notes learns how, because that's important for when it's time to study. Uh, portfolio development check, who in here does a portfolio? Right, and so you can throw out there, I have you know, four or five portfolios in my office when they say, hey, what's it supposed to look like? And I'll say, well, it's in the syllabus. Everything that I grade on is in the syllabus. But if you wanna see some examples of some, I have five or six in the office, you can go, you can look at them, right? So give them an example of what is a, a, an exemplary for that type of project, and then, uh, but it, it's best to communicate to the group as a whole, rather than saying, hey, Christine, um, I know your group, tell your group that you're supposed to do such and such and such and such. And then she's going to go back and they're going to say, Christine's bossy. <laughs> right? <laughs> so communicate to the group as a whole. Um, HACCP project. How many of you have, a, have them do a, that teach a serve safe, have them do a HACCP project? I got to say, wh the school that I teach at now, they, they do it. Um, I've taught sanitation there twice now and I don't. Uh, HACCP is, I th personal opinion, you guys make your own opinions, but I think it's higher level of education than the associate level. I really do. So what I have them do is a master cleaning schedule project. Right? Tell me who's responsible for what and when. I think it's more practical that that's what they're gonna do when they get into industry than, uh, than actually writing a HACCP plan. Is it important stuff? Absolutely. But I'd much rather cover what I find to be the most basic things. So that's just opinion. Uh, but you could certainly have them work on the HACCP project as a group. And let's face it, it is a very difficult task to put together a HACCP, so group uh, project in that case might be called for. Case studies, uh, prep for standard exam standardized exams like the Serve Safe, last minute study for quizzes or tests, business plan, marketing plan if you teach in other hospitality areas. <clears throat> All right, so that was the group that lasts for the whole term. Then we come to the formal learning groups. These are short term in nature. They're gonna last anywhere from one class period to a couple weeks, right? And you say, why would you have a, a different group? Because of diversity, right? If you three spend the whole time of your whole college career at the same group, you're not gonna get to learn her or, or her ideas or her uh, idiosyncrasies. So we use the base group as the foundation for collaborative learning but then they extend that on into the formal groups. Uh, but here's very important. Students are assigned roles, right? So a student may be assigned role as note taker or motivator, because let's face it, when you get a, a, gr a group of students together, sometimes they want to play, right? They want to talk about Saturday night and what they were doing and their new rims and whatever, right? So you assign one person as the, the role of motivator. Now, you are still in the classroom, Right, so you're motivating too, but that person's job is to say, hey, this, we need really to get back to the topic at hand, right? and, and let's, let's get through this project. Um, but then I find it best if you rotate that role. right? So let's say it's it, it, a one class project, you're probably not gonna be rotating roles, uh, but if you do a class project today and then one next week, then don't let the same person be the motivator, don't let the same person be the recorder, or the researcher, or whatever roles you come up with. Try to rotate them. Uh, instructor's role in this case is the guide on the side. So earlier when we were talking about what are, the, what are the, your ideas of collaborative learning, what do I do? I leave the front of the classroom, I go back there and I talk to a group. Why? Especially with your, with your three or four people groups, right? We could split out in here, maybe there's six or seven groups in here. Um, I wanna make sure that each group is going in the right direction. I don't want them to get uh, askew, and then I wind up at the end of class, I'm like, what were you doing, right? You've been there, I know you have. Um, so it, it's important for you to run around the room, make sure that everybody is, is on, on focus, but also, uh, you probably use the Socratic method just like most teachers, and asking questions, right? So you go up to the group and say, so what are you guys talking about? I, I'm teach I taught a class last, uh, 
this past spring, modern cooking techniques and menus. And I don't know if you guys know, but the molecular gastronomy, there's not a, lot of, there's not, there's not a textbook out there for that. So it's a lot of research and, and having to put these things together as a group. And so I would go to these groups, and I'm like, okay, so what are you guys thinking? And they would give me something that sounds just way over the top. I'm like, okay, let's, let's tone it down. <laughs> Right, so just to give them direction, but then to ask them questions. Now, why are you choosing to use carrots with blah, blah, blah? Is, is there a purpose? You know, and, and so what that does is it forces them to open up in their own conceptions of what they had. They were just thinking, carrots goes with, with, with rabbit, right? But why? So using that Socratic method and, and questioning them constantly. Um, and then students become the discoverers of knowledge and they also get to experience the diversity within their group. That's great. Um, I find that offering bonus points to the group, and I know that teachers sometimes hate bonus points. I do. They say, oh, have they catered my event for some bonus points? No. <laughs> um, but you can offer the group bonus points. You say, everybody in the group gets a bonus point if collectively your averages are above a certain point. All right, so if everybody in the group gets an 80 or above, I'll give you five extra points. What, now, why is, that in, why is that incentive so important? It makes them want to work together. It makes them want to work together. It makes the straggler, which there's always going to be a straggler, depend on the other, the, the smarter folks. It makes them teach the straggler. And what do you learn when you teach? What you didn't know. All right, so the formal learning group's great for master cleaning schedule, prep lists, lab projects, catered events. You know, some of, um, some of you have to do catered events because the president called. All right, this is a good thing for um, formal learning groups. Restaurant menu design, if you're teaching a, um, a front of the house class, restaurant service. Research or foodborne illness with oral report. Um, when I teach Serve Safe, I can't stand going through all of those, all of those uh, bacteria and talking about listeriosis and salmonella and I'm like okay it's boring so what I do is I have them do the research I don't have to have it formalized in a paper I don't really care I just don't want to teach it and I want you to learn it right so I have them go and ask Google you know what what are the when's, when was the last outbreak of listeriosis so, and and how many people did it affect and what are the preventative measures and and all, all of the, the, all the relevant information that you would want to teach with that. So the burden is on them. They self-discover. Um, topical papers, organizational flow charts, if you teach in hospitality, um, that might be something to do in case studies. All right, so the, inform the last type of group is the informal group, which is ad hoc. All right, so that's kind of what we did earlier, turn to your partner. Or... Uh, maybe it's a little bit different. You find a different way of choosing groups. Like Dr. Mayo said earlier, keep the diversity in the, in the style going. So you could say, all right, uh, whoever has black hair, you're the group leader today, right? And you can, you can, you know, this time you can say, you get to pick your, your, your three teammates, or you can say, whoever's got blonde hair, you're, and I know that's, that's kind of hard to do, but, um, you know, numbering them off, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, it's boring, right? So maybe find different methods. Who's got the earliest birthday in the year, right? Who's, bo who's born in June, all right? All those people, they get to be the team leaders this time. So there's, there's ways of picking uh, those groups that are break up the monotony. Uh, but groups are formed on the fly and are random. Informal groups are used for, useful for breaking up the lecture into shorter segments. So short projects that you can do in class and I think, what, one to two to three minutes? That's it. That's all we're talking about. But what it does is it breaks up you having to listen to me, right, because you get bored. You get, um, how many of you actually have seen the, the eyelids of your, t of your students? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it breaks up that monotony. Uh, allows for greater diversity. Because of the small size, it requires them to participate. They can't, they can't be the slacker because it's only one or two or, two or three people. Um, and then increases the amount of material retained by students from daily lecture. Uh, the, in the informal group is great for turn and talk, which is what we did earlier. Think, pair, share. Turn and talk, same thing or similar. Uh, note check, if, if you don't want to have them meet in the base group to do that, you can do that with a partner. 
uh, exit ticket, which we talked about earlier, write down one thing, or um, um, at, the end of your uh, at the end of your class and you're winding down, you're doing that oral assessment or review, and then you uh, also should preempt them for the next week's lesson or the next time you meet, whenever that is. Uh, so maybe that exit ticket is, uh, maybe it's the, it would be the entry ticket for the next week's lesson, right? What do you know about that? Uh, so you can do that both ways, entry ticket or exit ticket, right? Keep the note cards by the door. As you walk in, you know that that's what we do here. Grab a note card because you're going to need an entry ticket, uh, and then you're going to need an exit one. Critical thinking exercises, uh, short product ID exercises. This is one that I do that I absolutely love. Um, I think it's so much fun, and it proves to your students um, at the beginning of their, their journey through college that you know what the hell you're talking about, <laughs> right? Sometimes you have to prove that to your students because they don't know. They, they've not been in your world. And that is uh, um, sensory overload day. When, who uses on cooking? In, in on cooking, there's like chapter four, five, or six, I can't remember, yeah. but it's flavors and flavorings. And so what I do is I get the little quart containers or the pint containers, and I put uh, dextrose and, and uh, um, powdered sugar and cornstarch, everything that looks the same. I put it in an area. And then what we wind up with is about 150 ingredients on the table. You know, all the different peppers, uh, uh, cayenne and paprika and uh, smoked, and all these different things are on the table. Cumin seeds, cumin powder, um, everything that you can imagine that you can find in the spice room. And we go through it and we talk about each one and what are the characteristics, what kind of cuisines do you find oregano in. And it, oh, it's so funny, uh, Italian food. Is there any else? <laughs> there is. Anyway, um, yeah, it's like uh, cilantro belongs to Mexico. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, but what I do after that, that's, that's not the, the cool part. I mean, that's fun for me, but it's not the really cool part. The really cool part is when you say, okay, uh, the, the lids have the name on it of what it is, and then I will take every single lid and throw it into a bus tub and shake it up. And I say, okay, here. You guys have to put the lid on the proper ingredient and you have to get at least one person to agree with you before you do it, right? So they're over there at the salt, and they're like, oh, this is, this is iodized or kosher, right? It requires engagement just to get the project done. Um, now, doing that one time does not work, I'll be honest with you. What I do is I leave it in the classroom for two to three weeks, and I'll have them at the beginning of the class. Okay, lids are off, go for it. But by the time they're done with it, they know that they have to touch the cornstarch to know that it's cornstarch. They know that, that if they're going to tell it's powdered sugar versus dextrose, they have to taste it, right? Uh, but another thing that it highlights is the importance of labeling. If you don't, so there's lots of lessons that can come from a project like that. Um, lab rotation. And I'm going to show you a form here on the next slide, I believe it is, um, for lab rotation. Uh, review what's the best answer. And this is like that serve safe exam. You know, there may be more than one right answer. One's the best one, though. And so the discussion that happens about the best answer, why is it the best answer, how does it more appropriately answer the question, that can be helpful in a, a group uh, setting. Short activities to break up lecture, we talked about. All right, so this is my meeting time schedule, and I copied it from Word into PowerPoint, and that's what it looks like. It doesn't look like that in Word, though, I promise. But the idea is that I tell students, and I do this day one. This is, the, this is when they walk into class, all right, what's your story? Let's talk about who you are, get to know each other, some uh, 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 ice-breaking exercises, and then they ha I give them this sheet. And I tell them, at eight, pretend at 8 o'clock you have to meet with two people, right? the same two people. And then at 9 o'clock you have another meeting and you have to meet with two people. And then at 10 o'clock, or it depends on the size of the class, but if I have a small class, maybe it's just one person. You write their names in, they write your names in. And then throughout the semester, I'll say, all right, get with your, your 9 o'clock partner. I'm going to write it down in my grade book so I know, I know who they worked with that day. And then, you know, the next time we meet, all right, with your 12 o'clock partner. Right? They don't know what's going on when we do it. So it ensures the heterogeneity. Uh, heterogeneous mix that we want because they don't know why they're doing it. And then, of course, if, you know, if you've got a lot of students, sometimes they have to double up. That's just the way the, the cookie crumbles. And so I'll wait until they get 
full, they're like, I'm meeting with everybody. Okay, now you can meet with people twice, right? So there's ways around that. Now, you always have the, the issue of people, you know, not showing up. Right? So if you're with your 10 o'clock group and you're the only one there, that's a problem. So how do you fix that? All right, you're 10 o'clock, why don't you just jump in that group that you know, somebody else didn't show up. Right? But it keeps it random. They don't know why they do it when they do it, but they understand it afterwards. And I am convinced the best way to hate someone is to move in with them. <laughs> right? Have a roommate. <laughs> the second best way, to be their partner through culinary school the whole way. Right? You probably went through that. I did. I've got one buddy that, we're, I mean, we're still buddies. And then there was one guy that I had garmage with. He dropped because of us. <laughs> you don't like those people. Um, so this ensures that every time they meet, they're working with somebody different. They don't have to deal with that person that's so bossy every time. Because <clears throat> you get through halfway through the semester and they're like, can we switch partners? Um, no. <laughs> uh, learning activities that break up lecture. We talked about the entrance ticket, the exit ticket, uh, also the, uh, the big question. Video. You can use YouTube or other professionally made videos, and I'm not saying that YouTube is professionally made always, but there are professionally made videos out there that you can use um, to highlight the topic. Remember on that cone of experience, that demonstration was right there in the middle, so we want to maximize effectiveness, use the lower portion of that as well as middle. Uh, or invest in a GoPro, and this is what we've done at Faulkner. And this is something I feel really passionate about. And that is that since we in Alabama, the whole state, does, we don't have an attendance policy. And that drives me crazy. And if I wanted to run for state senator, I could probably get that fixed. But that's how it happened. We don't have an attendance policy. So how do you deal with that? When I taught in Texas, I could say, you miss four days. Tomorrow, if you miss, I'm going to drop you. That's a good threat for a student to say, oh, I better come to class or I'm a waste of my money. In Alabama, they think they can show up and take the final and pass. Sorry, dude, you can't. So state law prohibits State law prohibits it. Isn't that something? Yes. I've never heard of that. At all schools in Oakland, in, uh, in all state-funded schools in Alabama. Yeah, I know. When I got there, I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Some financial aid, the student has to report. They have to report whether they show up or not. Yes, they have, to, they have to show up or not. So we get the census date right. report. We report that they show or not. And then if they, sh if, if they have, they get their cash. If they get an F at the end of the term, they get an F. They, okay. it, it, it does put us in a precarious situation because it's up to the school to collect those funds. We have to pay it back to the federal government. Um, but like I said, the, the, the state thinks that they know better. So what was my point? Because I didn't mean to get off of that. Uh huh. Um, and, and now I'm finding we post on the LMS their grades. When they get to whatever they want, they stop showing up. Oh. They're happy at a 50, oh. and they don't show up anymore. That's unfortunate, too. They're happy at a 60 or 70 or whatever. So it, it, it is a challenge. The apprenticeship, three misses, and it's, it's regular. Three misses are out of the apprenticeship system. But yeah. But you know, this really speaks to workforce readiness as well. They need to be in class. And so we need a way to, to make them be in class. If you didn't show up for work, what would happen? You, you get fired. So that's, that's workforce readiness. So hopefully the state will come up with that. Anyway, the, what I feel, feel very passionate about is uh, maybe in investing in a GoPro and doing lectures from your desk, right? You're doing the same exact lecture that you're doing in class, the same exact lecture. Um, Try to use some humor, be funny, make it entertaining. But then, make it in small snippets or smaller subjects, put it in your, your online learning platform. Why? Because today, today I had jury duty. I couldn't go to class. What can I do? I can at least log into my, my Blackboard and I can watch the videos of the lectures that were covered. Or, let's say that I'm, I'm, I'm less, um, uh, my, my aptitude's not quite as high as the others in the class. I can use it as a supplemental form of instruction. Chef talks too fast. What can I do? I can either record him in class, which I'm, sometimes I say things that are not so appropriate. So, you know, if at least I'm using the GoPro, I'm at my desk and I know this has got to be good. <laughs> but they can go on their Blackboard and, and cover the subject that they either missed 
or they didn't get sufficient instruction on. Yes, sir. On the one hand, I understand the concept and the benefit of GoPro, but on the other hand... It, and it doesn't have to be a GoPro. It can be any camera. Fine. But at that point in time, what incentive is there for the students to come to class? To come to class? And to engage in class <laughs> where not only are they learning, but through their interaction with their yeah. peers, they're learning. Maybe I should run for Senate. <laughs> to change that law, because right now there's no reason, I mean, other than a grade, there's no reason for them to come. Um, they, I mean, there are daily projects that they have they to do. That's, how, that's how I have to build it. You, as they might learn from their peers by being in yep. class and interacting. Yes. But if they're not there, right. they're not sitting at the back of the class on Facebook. Yes. Keep in mind, I'm talking about this as a supplemental form of instruction, not, not, a, not a replacement for, right? So if you miss the subject, is, this is it's not a replacement for. You still have to come to class. You still have to do the things that other people do. This is not, this is not going to let you pass and, and, and essentially give you the schedule that you want because you can sit at home in your underwear doing that. You no, know, no, it's not a replacement. Yes, absolutely. I went to a school in Kentucky called Sullivan University in Louisville, and uh, we had a, a program called Plus Friday, right? So you go to school Monday through Thursday, and if you did really good, then you get Friday off. Now, if you wanted to come Friday, you could. Guess who was there every Friday? Yeah, there are those students that want to learn more. They want, they're hungry. And so this is essentially just a plus experience for them. Um, so that's the video. Turn and talk, which we talked about. Turn, turn and discuss with your partner. Again, keep those short, one to two minutes. They don't need to be taking too much time. Uh, technology, maximize the constructive use of smartphones. They're going to bring them anyway. Um, has anybody ever heard of pollanywhere.com? That's a fun one. I think it's a lot of fun. You can actually uh, build a poll, and they, re they reply with text, and then you have instant results on whether they understood the content or you need to review something a little bit more. Uh, think, pair, share, which we talked about, we've, we've experienced already. All right, so to break up the instruction here, I want you guys to draw this on your sheet of paper. And this is one of those activities that's not really relevant to the topic. It's not. But it's breaking up the instruction, getting rid of the monotony. Draw that and you tell me how many triangles there are there. Uh, and you're welcome to get with a partner. Some of you have a challenge drawing it. You don't have to draw it. You can just count up there. You guys notice this is a project from Domino's. <laughs> they put it online. They said you get a free pizza if you answer it right. So when you're using collaborative exercises like this, not only does it give them a break from the monotony, it gives you a break. It's a good thing you weren't an artist. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just teasing you. All right, who got less than 20? We got three less than 20. Who got between 20 and 25? Who got 25 to 30? Who got over 30? How many did you guess? How many did you guess? 64? I just guessed. Oh. <laughs> yes, how many did you get? 37 is the answer. There's 37. If you don't believe me, draw it and take it home. I don't care. <laughs> That's what Domino said it was. I'm going to take their word for it. Can you explain to us where you got the 35? Since you got the 35, can you? See, and that's what happens. That's what happens in the collaborative classroom. That's what happens in the collaborative classroom. Wait a minute. He got something? What? That's not what I got. Explain that. 
So you, it's a good way to, to introduce in, uh, discussion into your class. And you all know the benefits of discussion. Relevant discussion. Are people still counting to see the 37? All right, so I'm going to play the role of motivator and move it on. <laughs> all right, so forces hindering group performance. And these are some, some ways to deal with them. Find your own way. Uh, lack of group maturity. Assign roles and set clear expectations. All right, so uh, Dr. Mayo said this morning, form the group first, then give them clear expectations. Give them clear instructions. They know exactly what they're supposed to do. And then if you have the role of motivator, and they understand there's a time crunch, motivator says, hey, wait a minute, we only got 10 minutes left. Let's go, let's go, right? We have to have this project completed. Um, pejorative contributions by one or more members, you've all experienced this. Negative Nancy, Debbie Downer. <laughs> Explain the brainstorming process and the importance of diversity. I understand that's not going to correct every action out there or every behavior, but it is a step in the right direction, especially to, with today's tolerance issues. Right? Let's talk about being tolerant. Let's, let's talk about what, what is brainstorming. It's, it's throwing out ideas, whether they're right or wrong. Right? So can you be tolerant? <laughs> Please. Social loafing. Include a rubric for students to fill out to assess each other's performance. Now, um, this gets into a touchy subject, too, because students want, don't want to be graded by other students. But let's face it, in the collaborative group, those other students may be the only ones that know. Right? So you, you give them the, the rubric designed for that project, but then you also, within the rubric, you explain that they'll also be graded by their peers. Now, you take the grade that you give the group and the grade that you give the peers, decide how to weight it, merge them together. Each, each person gets an individual grade that way. Now the person that, that did the most work doesn't feel so negative about this person loafing because it's going to come out, right? The, the proof is in the pudding or the cream rises at the top. And how do you do that effectively? You have to do it during personal time, right? When they're taking an exam or a quiz, put it as the last sheet on the page. Because if they do that as a group, everybody gets an A, mm -hmm. right? Don't, don't allow the social uh, pressures to force that grade. Do it in private time. I have a, I have a question for yes, you ma'am. Project. You're never going to please everybody. But then it turns into, this person's just saying this, how, how do you stop that without it becoming a bigger issue? It, usually when it is an abuse like that, you'll know. Okay. Right? You can, because you're allotting time in the classroom to watch these people inter okay. interact. So you, you know when there's a, a loafer. What you need to do is formalize it and, and it to be objective. Okay. And you can't say objectively that you watch that person 100% of the time to know. So you have to rely on the, the collaborative group okay. to assess that. But you're right. You, you, you're going to have that. And again, you can't, you can't please everybody. All right, so social loafing. Free riding. Yes, ma'am. So social loafing is the guy that just, that just doesn't speak up. He realizes he can get away with it, and he just, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to get away with it. Free riding is just saying, I ain't doing it. Y'all can do this, and I'll take your grade. No, here's a, here's a great thing to use. Allow pink slips. All right, group, here's your one pink slip. You get to fire one person if, if they don't meet your expectations. How many times do you think that's going to happen? Every time? No, no it won't. won't. No, because what are the consequences of getting fired? You either have to do the project on your own, which some people may prefer. That, that's true. I was the guy that said I'd just rather work on my own. Um, or they have to get rehired by another group. Eesh. So they go to another group and say, hey, can I, why'd you get fired? Because you weren't doing your work? Yeah, we're going to pass. So you make, the, you make the consequence so negative that, they, that they, they're like, no, nah, I'm not going to get fired here. No, I've, I've got a good group. I think I'm going to stick with them. And, and I'm going to have to participate or they'll fire me. <laughs> right? So you give them the ability to fire people. I think if you use this, you may have one or two slip-ups. You won't have many past that. All right. Yes, yes. Yeah, I'm talking about college. I, I did teach high school one year, and I told them I'd quit if they made me do it again. <laughs> Love high school students. Glad you have a heart for it. I do not. 
Uh, loss of motivation to perceived inequity. In other words, you feel like you deserve a better grade than the other. That's, again, clearly set roles within the group. And then use that rubric for self-assessment. Lack of teamwork skills. Be ready for intervention, right? Uh, people don't naturally come to class knowing how to work together. They may need some coaching on that. Uh, teach them how to work together and be respectful of others. Inappropriate group size. <clears throat> the greater the number, the fewer the contributions for each. Right, so keeping your groups smaller is best. Uh, bigger is best for diversity. Smaller is best for contribution. <clears throat> All right, so the role of the guide on the side or your role as instructor or, or uh, facilitator, you know, you, ha you got to have good listening skills. You got to have observe or observation skills, constant assessment, uh, organization, plan. He, uh, Dr. Mayo talked about that this morning. Plan it. Don't wing it, because if you wing it, what does it look like? You're un you're unprepared and you're just making it up as you go, and nobody respects that. So make sure you plan it. Uh, conflict re resolution, you've got to be able to deal with people and their problems, ob have objective measures, uh, explain thorough concepts, and then have overall great leadership skills. You have to be able to do all those things. And then be ready to intervene. Groups are going to have problems. You've got to be ready with, um, with a solution right there. And may, let's say you don't have a solution. So you jump into the group. All right, guys, so what's the problem? They explain the problem. OK, what's the solution? Sorry. <laughs> what's the solution? How do we fix this? How do we get over it? And so this person says, oh, well, if John would work, yeah, that would make everything OK. Now, you heard earlier that embarrassment might fix some problems. Peer pressure works too, right? So use a little bit of peer pressure um, and, and find out what they want to do to fix the, the situation. And maybe that, that situation is that that person gets fired from the group. Um, giving personal collective feedback, now this is to the, the individual or the group. Focus feedback on behavior that you observe during the group activities, right? Not necessarily the behavior that so-and-so said about such and such, but make sure you see. Now, if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, Gina's loafing, you can definitely go watch Gina, mm -hmm. right? And say, hmm, Gina, I've noticed you're loafing. You don't say, well, Jennifer said that, that you know, Gina's loafing. Right, so you keep that, make that objective that you observed. Uh, be descriptive, not judgmental. Be specific and concrete. Make feedback as immediate as possible. Students love feedback. Uh, and then focus on positive actions, positive reinforcement, and then present, present feedback both orally and on grading rubrics. If you're using an online platform, uh, Blackboard, feedback is so important. When they take a test, make sure you write in those things. I know it's a little extra work, but it's meaningful for the student to understand why they got that question wrong, especially in online courses. Uh, and I know we're, we're running short on time. Sorry, guys. I'll try to speed it up a little bit. Um, we're almost done. Uh, when you're developing your rubrics, ways to measure the grades for these people, because you do have to give those grades, uh, you want to use this acronym SMART. It needs to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and transferable. <laughs> right? You need to make sure that you have all of those things met. Uh, and then the rubrics. Review the lesson and, and the student performance. Define the assessment procedure. Uh, how are they going to be assessed? And then brainstorm to decide importance on these issues. And then develop, finally develop the rubric and developing uh, descriptors like poor, good, very good, exemplary, whatever the case. Um, I know that rubrics tend to be a mystery for some. Um, for, me, it, for me, when I started teaching, I was like, what? And so this is a nice little way to develop your rubric. Uh, grading concerns. All students should know and understand learning goals, criteria, and standards before the collaborative work begins. Um, and then some of the grading that I was telling you earlier, take the individual plus the grade group on projects, average the two, decide how you want to weight it, and then that would be their final grade. You can give credit as participation in your informal groups. Like if they just did a daily exercise, it was an ad hoc group, you did it or you didn't do it. Uh, individual assessment over collaborative work. Um, let's say that your collaborative project is a research, research or term paper, right? They turn it in. Okay, you're done. Are you? Give them assessment on what they did for that term paper, right? Tell me, explain to me in your own words, uh, or paraphrase your report in your own words, right? If you didn't contribute to that work, you're lost and you're just going to have BS, right? But if you were, if you were part of the uh, authorship of that, then you're going to know what you're talking about. Or give uh, some type of test or quiz on the project. 
And then lastly, research team model, you can have authorship, and this would be decided within the group, authorship, joint authorship, uh, junior authorship, and non-author. So if somebody didn't contribute at all, they would be a non-author. If someone contributed, they, they like, yeah, I did a good bit of the work here, then they might be a joint author or main author, right? And that's just a way of, of, of breaking up the, uh, the differences. And that's about what I've got today on active and collaborative learning. Do we have any questions, any more contributions? I'm not going to make you give me an exit ticket today. Yes, ma'am. Um, the skill that, that you're measuring needs to be transferred.